In the early 1970s in Austin, Texas, a young guitarist began to make his name on the local blues circuit, tirelessly committed to a musical form many thought outdated. Ten years later, that same guitarist became an international phenomenon. A player of passion, energy and awe-inspiring technical virtuosity, Stevie Ray Vaughan not only brought the blues heritage of his home state to a global audience, but also reinvigorated the genre itself and introduced it to a new generation of listeners. Stevie just seemed to live and breathe music every single minute. It was just his whole life. This was a burning fire that didn't have anything to do with what people thought. And you've witnessed some of his live gigs where you would think, you know, he's going to just break the guitar in half with his hands. It's genuine. It was sweet. It's not the kind of intensity you think, oh, why does he have to act like that, you know? Only he could come up with that type of emotion without it being an act. This film not only looks at the formative years of Vaughan's career, his influences, his first recordings, and the various bands in which he honed his craft, but also traces the history of Texas blues itself and identifies Vaughan's place within a larger tradition. It is the journey of both a musical form and the single-minded musician who brought it back into the spotlight. His guitar playing just jumps right off the record. It just grabs a hold of you, and it's just undeniable. What he did with the sound was totally unique and nobody has come close. Stevie just did it because he had his own ideas and he was committed to his music. And if he'd end up just playing clubs all the rest of his life, rather than sacrificing who he was musically, he probably would have chosen playing clubs the rest of his life. He knew what he wanted to do. Stevie brought respect back to blues. He brought recognition back to blues but by making it a completely unique, original, and modern sound again. This guy was really a master artist. You gonna mug me? I might gotta mug you. It's that gorgeous one, eh? And I believe I can run a decent marathon. Thank you very much. Download Veeley now. When Stevie Ray Vaughan broke into the mainstream in the early 1980s, he cut a distinctive and contradictory figure, seemingly archaic and out of date, yet also explosive and refreshingly different. He was a standard bearer for a form of music that had been dismissed as unfashionable and unmarketable for over a decade, the blues, and his global success revitalized the genre. Blues has always had ups and downs, but it had been down for a long, long time. Record deals were very few and far between. Just being taken seriously was, was not, not happening. So for Stevie to make such an impact worldwide, change that, change that. All of a sudden, people were starting to pay attention, and it really helped everyone from, from the ground up. Nobody else is making this music by this stage, or nobody is making it and selling it in any sizable quantities. He refreshes the blues. He makes the blues hip again. So hugely significant, both in terms of its influence on white rock and roll, but also in what it does to black music. Johnny Hooker in the 1980s and early 1990s sells more records in that sort of decade than he sold in 40 years up until that point. And Stevie Ray Vaughan has one hell of a lot to do with that. Stevie Ray Vaughan, almost single-handedly, you know, there are other people, there's George Thorogood, there's uh, uh, Robert Cray, but Stevie Ray Vaughan is the superstar. He's the man who puts blues back on the map and makes people want to listen to the blues again and realize that there's something worth hearing. Vaughan wasn't only creating a resurgence of interest in the blues, but in particular, he and his band Double Trouble presented a distinctive, region-specific strand of this genre, 
born from a rich tradition of music emanating from the American territory in which they were raised, Texas. This large state, briefly a republic in its own right, had a singular history that would itself become etched into the music that emerged from it. Propelled by a philosophy of rugged individualism, at first it was the home of ranchers and cowboys, the icons of the American frontier. Yet where these inhabitants looked to cultivate the land, Texas would soon become forever associated with the riches found under its soil at the dawn of the 20th century, oil. This discovery changed the state from a vast yet sparsely populated rural province into one of the largest economies in the country. Yet the musical tradition that inspired Stevie Ray Vaughan and countless other white Texans sprung from the laborers of one of its other key industries in the early 20th century. In the cotton fields of East Texas and in the poor black communities set up around them, the sharecroppers developed the blues. And it was from this marginal world that the first notable Texas bluesman emerged. Blind Lemon Jefferson. Blind Lemon Jefferson is the first great male blues guitarist. He was born, we think, around 1893, son of sharecroppers. By 1917, uh, he's in Dallas playing the guitar on street corners and already becoming a big star. I mean, it's said that he was earning $150 a week in tips on the street. Now, in 1917, that is one hell of a lot of money. He starts recording in 1926 for Paramount, and he goes to Chicago to record. Very short recording career. He's only recording for four, four years before he dies. But the recording industry is in its infancy in 1926 when he starts and prior to that we've had Mammy Smith and, and some of the, the, the female blues singers really singing back by what you'd have to call a jazz band. But Blind Lemon Jefferson is the first solo guitarist playing the blues on record. <laughs> She told me late last night, you don't need no mama no help. He's got this kind of haunting, moaning voice, these fantastic songs like See That My Grave Is Kept Clean and Black Snake Moan. And he's a phenomenal guitar player. And you can hear that even through the hiss and the crackle of the records because the quality uh, uh, of the preservation of these recordings is, is not that great. But he's a phenomenal guitarist. He's playing these single note lead runs and then these bass lines and these choppy rhythms and pulls and tremolos. I mean, in a way, you can hear all the techniques that we have come to associate with electric guitar playing being essayed, really, on, on this rudimentary acoustic guitar. Where Jefferson provided the template for the blues guitarist, Two of his protégés would further his style and develop the sound of Texas blues beyond its acoustic origins, and they too would become hugely influential figures. T-Bone Walker and Lightning Hopkins. T-Bone Walker was born in Texas in 1910, so he's about 17 years younger than Blind Lemon Jefferson. But he hooks up with Jefferson uh, in the 1920s, um, becomes his eyes, leads the, the, the blind man around, and of course, while he's doing that, um, learns all his guitar tricks.
Texas blues has always been the guitar. That's what defines the Texas sound, is the playing of the guitar, the way one approaches that instrument. T-Bone emulated the style of Blind Lemon. He does take a lot of the patterns and the kind of single string arpeggio runs that one hears in Blind Lemon, but he's applying them to an electric guitar, an electrified guitar. T-Bone introduced the electric guitar as a lead instrument in rhythm and blues. T-Bone was highly sophisticated. T-Bone was a showman. He electrified the audience, not only with his guitar playing, which was incredibly virtuosic, but in just the way he presented himself on stage. Mother says, son, you was born lucky. But remember, you got to die one day. She was born lucky. Remember, you got to die one day. Lightning Hopkins is another pioneering Texas blues guitarist. Like T Bone Walker, he hooks up with Blind Lemon Jefferson in the 1920s. I mean, at this point, he's, he's playing an acoustic you know guitar, but he too Heart picks up an electric guitar. There are some sessions that are particularly significant in this context, which he recorded for the New York-based Herald label in 1954, where he plugged in. And I guess he took, he took the T-Bone the Walker style of electric guitar and just amped it up, rocked it up a little bit more. So you can see all of these things as, as different stations of the cross, really, on the journey to a fully electrified Texas blues sound. Whoa, she's a evil hearted woman. Whoa, she won't treat nobody right. There's a further link to the kind of blues rock element that Stevie Ray Vaughan eventually comes to represent because um, he gets taken up by the rock and roll crowd, if you like. You know, he's opening shows for the, the Grateful Dead. I think at one point in the late 60s, he even records an album with uh, the 13th Floor Elevators, who, who are this Texas garage band. So again, you know, the, the, the blues and the rock are coming closer together in the person of Lightning Hopkins. And there's a nice uh, symmetry, really, because he, he lives on till 1982, uh, which is when he dies. And, of course, is, is just when Stevie Ray Vaughan is getting going. For white Texans in the 1940s and 50s, however, awareness of the work of Walker and Hopkins was minimal. Although Texas was in part culturally distinct from the deep south states to its east, it shared their appalling racial politics and segregation was firmly in place and popularly supported across the state. Yet the music of the bluesmen did enter the consciousness of young white artists. And as the melding of styles that was rock and roll exploded across America, white Texan bands began to incorporate the sounds pioneered by these black musicians into their own work. One of the great things about music in Texas, we didn't pay much attention to segregation laws. The laws said blacks and whites and even browns, Mexican-Americans weren't supposed to mix. They always did with music. And in the 50s, for instance, in Dallas, the best known rock and roll act, they're really the first local band of any prominence was called the Nightcaps. And they were white boys doing rhythm and blues. Go to school around nine, I get in the corner and I drink my wine, 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 I drink it wine, 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 I drink it wine, 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 wine all the time. You get your girl, I'll get mine, we'll go out and buy some wine. Wine, wine, wine was an anthem for all kinds of kids growing up in Texas. And certainly the song Thunderbird, which 
Stevie Vaughan later, later covered, many people have covered. It was always there. As the next wave of the popular musical revolution hit the US in the mid-1960s following the coming of the British invasion, a handful of white Texans were again bringing their distinctive blues heritage into the spotlight, this time to both national and international audiences. Yet many of these acts, like the psychedelic garage band The 13th Floor Elevators, had to travel to the West Coast to make their name. And the most prominent, singer Janis Joplin, actively disassociated herself from her home state. At the close of the decade, however, a figure emerged who aimed to carry the torch sparked by Blind Lemon Jefferson back at the start of the century. Johnny Winter, signed in 1968 to Columbia Records with the biggest advance in the history of the recording industry, was a white singer and guitarist who proudly identified himself as a Texas bluesman. Winter was the guy that started all this, and it was Columbia signing him and offering him crazy money at the time that changed the rules and changed the way music was being looked at in Texas. Columbia signed him. Steve Paul made him into a star, basically selling black blues as played by an albino white as rock and roll. And, uh, you know, of course, Johnny Winter played uh, Woodstock uh, with this band. And it was very telling. He had a power trio, basically, uh, which really set the stage for bands like ZZ Top and then later for Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble. And uh, in his band was a, a bass player that came out of Dumas, Texas, up in the panhandle by the name of Tommy Shannon, and a drummer by the name of Uncle John Turner. Think of Texas blues as being a dirt road through the countryside. Johnny Winter paved it. He put the asphalt down. In part, what distinguishes Texas blues from, say, Mississippi blues is that the black population in Texas was much more dispersed throughout the state. There wasn't this heavy concentration. There had been in East Texas, but when the cotton fields were devastated by the boll weevil, people moved to the cities of Houston and Dallas, to some extent to Austin. But it was so, it was a much more diverse community. Johnny Winter grew up in the Golden Triangle, in the area around Beaumont and Orange, which produced Janis Joplin and others. These were people who were connected to a kind of swamp blues and they were connected to the Cajun and Creole sounds that they grew up hearing being so close to Louisiana. But Johnny Winter created a certain mythos about the whole idea of Texas blues and Texas music. And in that way, he influenced young musicians musically, but I think in a bigger sense, he helped define the marketplace, the branding for what the world began to recognize as being Texas blues. Despite Winter's swift rise to prominence, in the 1970s, new musical forms flourished and the blues once again returned to the margins. It would remain there for more than a decade before another artist emerged who both revitalized the genre itself and re-established the brand that Winter had developed. Dallas, Texas. It was here in 1954 that Stevie Ray Vaughan was born. At first raised along with older brother Jimmy in the Cockrell Hill area of the city by parents Jim and Martha, after numerous relocations, the family settled in the district of Oak Cliff in 1961. Jimmy and Stevie Vaughan grew up in Oak Cliff, which in the context of Dallas, Texas, even today, it's south of the Trinity River. It's blue collar working class. Whatever you think of Dallas as this new, shiny, you know, the TV series, the Dallas Cowboys, glittering buildings, that's all North Dallas. That's not Oak Cliff. 
that was traditionally the black part of town and today remains very African-American, Mexican-American, Mexican immigrant. And talk about a music history. Oak Cliff is where T-Bone Walker really got his chops. Aaron T-Bone Walker was also known as Oak Cliff T-Bone. Stevie's family was, I think, relatively typical in the sense that his father, who they called Big Jim, was a blue-collar worker that traveled wherever the jobs were. So the family was uprooted, at least temporarily on occasion, while he worked particular jobs. Stevie's mother, uh, also relatively typical in the sense that to make ends meet, she worked as an office worker, as a secretary. So that left some time for Stevie and Jimmy at home alone. And who knows, maybe that contributed to their interest in playing guitar because they had to fill their time with something. The brothers' interest in music was more than just a time filler, however. It soon became a passion. When they moved to Oak Cliff in 1961, first Jimmy and then Stevie had begun playing the guitar, yet the popular music of the time was far from stimulating. Despite being an incendiary force in the mid to late 1950s, by now the rebellious fervor of rock and roll had died down and the charts were dominated by crooners and doo-wop ensembles. For youngsters growing up in the segregated world of the South, however, the radio provided access into a far more raw and vital musical world that was emanating almost unnoticed from the black communities around them. And these stations and shows inspired a whole generation of white blues musicians. Kids in Texas, kids growing up in Dallas, at night when you had AM radio and, and you had these stations that were called Clear Channel stations, 50,000 watt, stations where you could hear uh, their signal from all over the place. In Dallas and in Fort Worth where I grew up, you could pick up WLS in Chicago. They had top 40 radio. WLAC in Nashville, the John R. show where John R. laid down some pretty serious blues and he also sold blues music through Randy's record shop. And also you cannot discount the Border Blasters, the Mexican radio stations on the border on the Mexican side of the Rio Grande that would exceed the power limits of the United States. So from the big X, XERF, XEG, XELO, that's where I heard Wolfman Jack turn me on to a generation of, of blues artists. Late night on the radio, I could get those powerful stations out of Louisiana and uh, Del Rio, the Wolfman Jack. Um, when I heard blues, I just, <laughs> I had to find out what it was. So the music just just, just uh, captured my, uh, my imagination. And I didn't even know what to call it. There was a radio station in Dallas called WRR. And at 10 or 11 o'clock at night, Jim Lowe came on with Cat's Caravan. And uh, it was everything it was all different then. And of course, I was supposed to be in bed asleep. And I was in bed, but I wasn't asleep. It was the typical thing. You have that radio right there. And you turn it up loud enough where you can hear it, but mom and dad don't. And, and, and that's when the blue, that's when Jim Lowe, he was playing Lightning Hopkins and all the Excello records. That's where I first heard Lazy Lester, Lightning Slim, all, all the Excello stuff and, and all the other stuff that was more, more bluesy and more hardcore R&B that was a little bit too, too deep for uh, top 40 in the daylight. I've been out west, I'm headed east, I want my baby back home with me, well she done grabbing me no train and gone. So now we knew what labels to look for, so we'd go to our record store and and just go through stuff, and when we saw Duke Records or Chess Records or Excello Records, VJ Records, when we saw those labels, it's like, oh, red flag, you know. So we discovered a lot on, on our own with some help from Jim Lowe and Late Night Radio. The subterranean nature of this interest in blues music shifted almost overnight with the coming of the British invasion in 1964. I am the little red rooster, too late. As the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the Yardbirds and many other acts introduced a wider American audience to music that had previously been marginalized, blues was elevated into the mainstream. 
In Oak Cliff, Texas, Jimmy Vaughan was becoming a serious scholar of the genre and passing his knowledge on to his younger brother. What has inspired you throughout the rest of your life? Who was your, your El Supremo? Um, my brother, Jimmy Vaughan. He's the reason I got started, and he's also the inspiration for a lot, a lot of musicians. Um, and because of him, I was, I was able to hear B.B. King, Freddie King, Albert Collins, Albert King, Lonnie Mack, Buddy Guy, Muddy Waters, Howlin' Wolf, Kitty Brill, Jimmy Smith, on and on, on and on. And they're all very big influences. Stevie was fortunate growing up to have an older brother who was bringing home music. Uh, and he was bringing home everything from blues to rock and roll. And then also about the same time, you've got the Beatles coming on Ed Sullivan and the whole British Invasion music exposing Americans to blues music. And certainly Stevie got all of those influences all at once. With popular music entering its most fertile period since the initial wave of rock and roll, in the mid-60s, both Jimmy and Stevie joined their first high school bands, the Pendulums and the Chantones, playing cover material at dances and talent contests. The Pendulums soon progressed to a wider circuit, however, and in this group, Jimmy Vaughan began to attract attention. By 1966, he was drafted into the Chessmen, who had enjoyed some local success, and soon the elder of the Vaughan brothers was being singled out as one of the best guitarists on the Dallas scene. In Dallas, there were labels like Adnet Records, which had uh, these pop acts, John and Robin and the In Crowd, Scotty McKay, who was really trying to imitate the Yardbirds doing blues. Uh, the Five Americans had national hits broke out of Dallas with I See the Light. One of these bands that kind of rose to prominence was the Chessmen. Now, Jimmy Vaughn joined it after the Chessmen were already kind of established. They had had a couple local hits, and when I say hits, there were singles that probably sold 5,000 copies maybe. But that would get you gigs at teen canteens and at clubs like Luann's, and maybe if you were lucky enough, you could back up someone like Jimmy Reed when Jimmy Reed came and played Luann's for the white kids. What it did for Jimmy is it gave him exposure. They were a big deal in Dallas. What's really strange about that is that when Jimmy joined the band, he was like 15, and just almost overnight he became the man at 15. And when all the guitar players are going, you got to hear this kid. Jimmy's name got around, and, and I, I finally heard him in 1967. He got a gig with the band The Chessmen, and there was a Sunday afternoon matinee at this club, and, and I heard Jimmy. I was excited to hear this kid that I'd been hearing about. I was like seven years older than him. And when I heard him, even though they were just doing covers, I went, well, I, I see why I had heard of him. I thought he was, at 17, I thought, this guy's better than... He's just, he's good. We, we, we will hear more of Jimmy. I, I, that, and most people felt that way. If the Chessmen offered Jimmy Vaughan exposure, the group provided something else for his younger sibling. Stevie was befriended by their drummer and vocalist, Doyle Bramhall, who gave the 12-year-old both encouragement and support, and the pair would become lifelong friends and occasional musical allies. Yet it was through Jimmy's record collection that the young guitarist found his inspiration. And in 1967, he was introduced to an artist who would prove a significant influence on his subsequent style and sound, Jimi Hendrix. When Stevie was just getting started on guitar, Jimmy brought home a Jimi Hendrix record, Purple Haze. And I think this really knocked Stevie for a loop. <laughs> Jimmy Hendrix is probably the single most significant figure in the fusion of blues and rock and in, it's, it's a, a much derided word these days, but in making it 
progressive, and by that I mean the genuine sense of the word of, of, of moving this music into uh, new uncharted territory. I, I, you know, he's, technically, he's a phenomenal guitarist. He's, he's got a, a, a deep reverence for the roots of the blues, but he's also played R&B with the Isley Brothers and so on and so forth. So, so he's got all the bases covered. <laughs> He's got this fantastic technique coupled with this fertile, inventive imagination, which leads him to experiment with sounds that you wouldn't previously have associated with an electric guitar. And one of the things that's interesting is that these people who have such a huge, profound influence on everything that follows them, so many of them are recording for such a short period of time. You know, we've talked about how Blind Lemon Jefferson's recorded career only lasted for four years. And of course, pretty much the same is true of Jimi Hendrix as well. There's his session work prior to that, but he begins recording with Jimi Hendrix experience in 1966, and by 1970, he's dead. And in the wake of Hendrix, rock music became heavier, and the spotlight shifted from frontmen to virtuoso lead guitarists. First Cream and then Led Zeppelin emerged from the UK, ushering in a new era of lengthy solos and extreme volume, and Stevie incorporated these new trends into his own playing. Now at high school and a member of the band The Brooklyn Underground, although a shy and quiet teenager, he was beginning to make his presence known to fellow musicians. Uh, I met him in the lunchroom at Kimball High School in probably 68, 69. I think it was his uh, sophomore year and it was my uh, senior year. And he just uh, came up to me one day and, hey, Roddy. <laughs> I didn't know who he was. And uh, he said, well, I'm Jimmy Vaughn's little brother. Went, oh, okay, you know. And I was, I was already playing with bands, you know, from, for, you know, three or four years. The first time we jammed together, I knew this guy's a serious guitar player. And uh, he would call me occasionally, hey, can you come by? You know, because I had a car, you know, and he didn't. We started going around town a little bit, you know, so... I remember the first time <clears throat> I said, hey, let's go down to the Aragon Ballroom. And it was this black club way over in South Dallas. And uh, so we go in this place and uh, the, the guy at the, front, at the front door, you know, he's got one eye, you know, and Stevie, yeah, go on in, man. So here I am, I'm 18, I can't even get into the clubs and Stevie's getting me into the door. So we'd go in and, and set in and play. And his big jam song was always Crossroads, the uh, Clapton version. That was, his, that was the big song. He'd get up there and tear it up. And everybody loved it. Clapton had a huge effect on Stevie. He could lip sync and air guitar every riff, you know, and, and spent hours and hours learning his style. But at the same time, uh, uh, my brother gave me a Albert King album one Christmas. It was Live Wire Blues Power. And uh, I loaned it to Stevie and I said, hey man, you gotta hear this, you know. So a year and a half later, I get the album back. <laughs> and I still have it, it has my name on there to make sure that he would know whose it was. <laughs> it was Albert King, a Mississippi-born guitarist and singer who had only risen to prominence in 1967 while he was in his late 40s, who had become the dominant influence upon the young Vaughan, drawing the teenager's attention away from British players to the authentic heart of the blues.
were some of the tunes, if you can remember, you know, some of the slow blueses, and what were some of the things that, that mm. uh, helped you develop your style? Albert King records, for one thing. B.B. King Live at the Regal. Uh, Albert King, Born Under Bad Sign, I guess it was called first. Mm -hmm. Or was it King of the Blues Guitar? I think it was Born Under Bad Sign. That's what they were calling it at the time. I remember seeing, believe it or not, Albert King on TV. Mm -hmm. doing, doing Born Under a Bad Sign, and I was like, yes! Yeah. <laughs> when singer-songwriter and future collaborator Mark Benno was first joined on stage by Stevie in 1969, King's style had by now become the key inspiration for the young guitarist, and his technique impressed the more established musician. He got up there and he played a kind of a skeletal Albert King. He didn't really have all the, the, the cards in the deck put together yet but he had a really sweet vibrato and an incredible tone. And uh, I remember people were screaming and it was already a phenomenon, but uh, he was no master of the guitar, but he was really talent for, talented for a you know, 98 pound kid. But he had a lot of obstacles, you know, being Jimmy Vaughn's brother. And at the time, Jimmy was uh, really not nice to anybody. It's not all. It's not all sweet Mary Poppins stuff here. I think Jimmy had some tough guys that he patterned himself after, and guitar players don't generally like each other very much anyway. It's a competitive uh, gunslinger type deal, and it sure was back then. And I remember he told Stevie, "Listen, you start teaching yourself how to play guitar. Don't ever play one of my licks again. You play that lick again, and 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 I, I'm gonna beat your butt." And, I, and, and what happened that night at, at the end of Cole is he played that lick again, which was one of Jimmy's favorite licks. And uh, let's just say that I witnessed something that kind of shocked me. He, uh, he uh, encouraged him to teach himself to play after that night. Although Jimmy Vaughan had begun to treat his younger brother in a harsh and irritable manner, other musicians on the scene were more nurturing no longer interested in playing covers of Top 40 material. In 1969, Jimmy had formed the blues group Texas Storm with Doyle Bramhall and singer Paul Ray, and these bandmates actively encouraged Stevie's development. Jimmy and I were playing a band together called The Storm, Texas Storm, and uh, Big Jim and Martha came in with Stevie, and he was just a little kid of 69, so whatever that made him, but uh, at the break, I had this old Gretsch country club fat guitar, it looked like furniture, it looked like a coffee table. And uh, Stevie was enamored of the look of the guitar and all. So during the break, he came over and he said, can I, can I look at your guitar? Because Jimmy was playing it every once in a while, just, you know, just to be playing it. And uh, I, he got it and was sitting there on the stage and he said, uh, Let's do Starry Monday, you know, mind if I play, you know, just do Starry Monday. And I said, oh, we're sitting right here, okay, this is good. We're sitting on the edge of the stage and it was break. So uh, we did just me and Stevie did Starry Monday. And that's when I went, he's learned some lessons. But he wasn't there yet, but he, I mean, he had all, had it all T-Bone and Jimmy and all the people he had heard. And Stevie was bringing these influences and techniques into his own ensembles. Having graduated from the Brooklyn Underground and another blues rock cover band, Southern Distributor, in 1970, he joined a far larger unit, Liberation, who had already established themselves on the Dallas club circuit. Here, he met saxophonist Jim Tremier. Liberation was a 10-piece horn band. We had two lead singers, and um, I had tonsillitis in my senior year in high school. When I came back after tonsillitis, Stevie was in the band. And um, my impression with, of him was he played better than anybody I'd ever heard up to that point. Stevie, although he was a rock player back then, he was totally steeped in blues. But he liked playing Clapton licks, he liked playing Crossroads, he liked playing Jimi Hendrix, but his first love was blues. I had a car, we would drive after school, he would have his guitar with him. He sat in the car the whole time playing guitar. He would play guitar, he would play guitar. He would play this and that, and he would repeat things over and over again. Uh, we would go to his house, listen to records. He loved John Lee Hooker. There was a John Lee Hooker album he would listen to over and over and over again. One of my 
my memories is a song called Boogie Woogie All Night Long, and uh, Stevie would play that song over and over. There was sort of a false ending where John Lee Hooker kind of, uh, 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 and Stevie loved the ending, and he copied it exactly like John Lee Hooker, and he would play it 50 times in a sitting. Liberation was a short-lived outfit, yet its live shows initiated the 15-year-old Vaughan on the Dallas club circuit. Shortly after he left the band in September 1970, he was then offered the chance to record in the studio for the first time. Local businessman John Bothwell was funding an album project entitled A New High, which would compile the work of five Dallas high school bands, and Stevie was invited to join Cast of Thousands on the record, a unit formed by songwriters Bobby Foreman and Jim Rigby. Bobby Foreman had heard him play, and then he calls and says, this guy's unbelievable. You're not going to believe how good he is. At the time, Jimmy Vaughn was, everybody said, that's the best in Texas. And there was no question. And Stevie was sort of, you know, the little kid brother. I would see him in school, but he was so quiet. And we all thought he was a druggie, which he may have been too. But the reason he was like he was was because he was play, sneaking out at night and playing in clubs at 15, 16 years old. So he was somehow playing all night, maybe getting a couple hours sleep and coming back and getting through school. The project was to be five bands, one from each of the South Dallas high schools. Each band would do two songs. So there was an album with 10 songs. The boys in the band would sell these albums as fundraisers. They would actually get a little bit of money, you know, a dollar here and there. Uh, and the promoter would uh, submit this to local radio stations and whichever band got the most airplay was going to get to record their own album. There had been a group in Fort Worth called Blood Rock who did a song about a, a, a traffic accident where somebody bleeds to death. And that, they're like a one-hit wonder. So that was enough success for this manager to think, okay, I can do this. I'll, I'll put this together. I'll pay for the recording studio. I'll promise these kids the moon. <clears throat> and, and possibly he was planning on delivering someday. Stevie Ray, uh, Stevie at that point, signs on. We start rehearsing, and instantly I realize I've never seen anybody like this kid. We practice, we go to the studio, and they like our stuff. We get to cut two songs. When Stevie starts to play, the people in the sound booth start leaning forward. And it's like they're almost pressing their face on the glass. And I look over, and he hadn't done this in the rehearsal, but his hand looked like a hummingbird. I mean, it was moving so fast that I couldn't make the fingers out. And the studio was blown away by Stevie. We're sitting there trying to concentrate on playing and singing and things, and I could see them out of the corner of my eye, almost like a child looking into a candy shop, just kind of leaning over, what in the hell is, is this? You know, because he was like a force of nature already. I heard a voice last night To me, it was just, it was a great moment, and we weren't trying to make it permanent. It's a high school band, but you see the potential there. He was, at that time, he hadn't found his own style. So he was imitating Eric Clapton and Jimi Hendrix, and that's where the speed stuff was coming from. admit that they didn't give this project their best material because they were afraid it was going to get stolen. So they were kind of holding back a little bit. So the song selection limited Stevie a little bit because it wasn't the band's strongest material. But still, we see that Stevie can take an original song and put guitar to it. He doesn't have to hear something on the radio and mimic it. 
This is new material. This is new guitar stuff. It's stuff created by Stevie for these songs. And the engineer who recorded all these five bands for the project said that after listening to all these bands and, and seeing Stevie play, he said, that guy's a ringer. This guy's got an unfair advantage. He, he, he must have been brought in specifically to win this competition, but, but he wasn't. You know, he was just the best guitar player around. Upon the record's release, Cast of Thousands received more airplay than any of the competing bands on the LP. Yet the project fell apart when organizer John Bothwell was arrested for murder. Yet Stevie Vaughan had already moved on by this time, working his way through a number of new outfits, including Pecos and the Derek Jones Party. It was in the band Lincoln, however, that he first worked with Christian Charles de Pleek, a vocalist whom he had long admired. In August 1971, no longer attached to any group, de Pleek brought Vaughan to the home of organist Noel Dice, where rehearsals were taking place for a new ensemble, Blackbird. And it was in this band that Stevie first came to prominence. I think he was 16 or 17 when I first met him. He's kind of reticent, uh, kind of a little bit of a shy kid. And I went, wow, this is Jimmy's brother, huh? You know, and uh, and because Jimmy was like the guitar god of the Dallas area at the time. You can't overemphasize the drive that Stevie had to be at least as good as his brother. He really wanted to be at least as good as Jimmy was, you know. And so when he came to play with us, it was kind of his chance, I think. You know, it was his chance to get away from the house and get out of the house and get into a band that could take him someplace. Blackbird fulfilled that need. Initially a six-piece ensemble, the band developed their act during regular shows at the Cellar Club in Dallas. And unlike Vaughan's previous groups, although Blackbird still played cover material, their repertoire was inspired by a new band whose unique sound was bringing Southern Roots music directly into the mainstream. In 1969, shortly after Johnny Winter's rise to prominence, an act emerged who would spearhead a new wave of music emanating from the American South the Allman Brothers Band. Drawing first hand from the blues and soul artists around whom they had grown up, this Floridian unit exhibited an authenticity that their British forebears could never deliver, and they became the inspiration and the template for Blackbird. The Allman Brothers got our attention because they had, first of all, Greg Allman is a wonderful singer, and between the two guitarists and the, the Hammond B3 and the drive, the sheer drive and creativity those guys had. Um, they were also a jam band, which we loved to do. We wanted to be a jam band, and that was part of our shtick. The way they synthesized all those elements together was just food for us, you know. For Stevie, the key inspiration within the band was their talismanic leader and virtuoso guitarist, Dwayne Allman. The Derek Jones party, their manager, Dan Lewis, his dad ran the ushering service at the State Fair Music Hall, so we would get free tickets. And I remember the night that uh, we got two free tickets to see the Allman Brothers Band, and Stevie and I sat up in the balcony right over the stage and watched the show and it's like blew us away. The two drummers slamming it and you know jamming and uh, Dwayne Allman and all them at the top of their game at that point. Two weeks later Dwayne Allman died. Stevie would study people. He studied Clapton, and I mean studied them. You know, he learned every lick on the record. And same thing with Dwayne. He listened to all their stuff. You know, that slide guitar style that he developed uh, was was new. It, it broke new ground, and I, Stevie wanted a part of that action. And uh, and one thing that's been that's never mentioned much is how great a slide player he really was. In that band, he. He just caught fire. You could just see smoke coming off of the fretboard when, when he got his slide out and just really went at it. 
But we had lots of practice at the cellar, so it was a, we were forever indebted to the cellar to this day, in a way. By late 1971, Blackbird were becoming a prominent fixture on the Dallas circuit, and Vaughan's lead work opposite fellow guitarist Kim Davis was establishing his reputation. In October, after years of poor attendance records and average grades, the band's success convinced him to quit high school and to pursue his musical ambitions on a full-time basis. This was the time when Stevie was really developing his tool set. He started as a reticent, shy kid, and he learned to be a showman in that band. He just caught fire. Um, and all that dueling with, with Kim and all the back and forth, that, that was a key part of our whole thing. And, um, and plus we had a black singer. Now that was also a big deal in Dallas. You just didn't see that many black guys in a rock band for one thing. He was a, and then the way that Christian dressed, he, he, he wore these big earrings and had these sort of moo-moo things on, you know, it's like really cutting edge, you know. We sort of took off in a different way than the copy bands that I'd previously played with, you know. We sort of got a little a bit of a cult following and uh, they, you know, started catching on. We had a friend, uh, Lou Stokes, he would draw these great posters and we started packing the little mini concerts that we were doing. The kids were starting to kind of catch on to it. We'd have three, four hundred people at a gig. And I said, you know, we thought we were on our way to stardom. <laughs> Blackbird's local success was, however, limited by the lack of opportunities in Dallas itself. Yet there was another city 200 miles south that had a growing reputation as a musical hotbed, Austin. And at the suggestion of their bassist, David Frame, it was here that the band relocated at the close of 1971. Mike Kendred, the pianist, uh, he played with the Mystics, and a really great pianist also. He started playing with this band Cracker Jack down in Austin, and, and Frame was really good friends with them, and Frame was going down to Austin to visit with Mike and, and watching this band Cracker Jack. It was Johnny Winter's old rhythm section, Tommy Shannon and Uncle John Turner. He would go down there, he, and, you know, he came back and says, man, we've got to move to Austin. We've got to. So I think David Frame had a whole lot to do with us moving down there. Austin was a progressive oasis in the heart of conservative Texas. The countercultural revolution that had spread through the US in the late 1960s had been harshly repressed across the state, yet this small college town had embraced it. The Vulcan Gas Company, the first major psychedelic club in Texas, had opened its doors in 1967, showcasing the most groundbreaking acts then emerging on the national scene, alongside local bands and blues and R&B legends. It had been followed by the Armadillo World Headquarters in 1970, the venue from which progressive country would blossom. And with numerous smaller venues scattered throughout the city, it was an obvious destination for the frustrated musicians of Dallas. That's what happened in the 1970s in Austin. There was a whole load of young, ambitious players like Paul Ray, Denny Freeman, Jimmy Vaughn, Stevie Vaughn, Doyle Bramhall, they all drifted down from Dallas. There was just more of a sense of community. It was just a small town. Dallas was a big town, big spread out, you know, and there was a lot of long-haired people up there, but it was a just, it was a big, fast city compared to Austin. Austin was a sleepy little college town with a whole lot of pretty girls in it. There was a few cities around the country that kind of had a a rep as being kind of havens for long-haired people and stuff. And, and Austin was just one of those places. There was a community of people like that. There, were, there was just a community of like-minded people and so you felt kind of safe and, and of course that would attract musicians. And so Austin became a music town in the 70s really in my opinion. Jimmy Vaughan and his sometime bandmates Denny Freeman, Doyle Bramhall and Paul Ray had gravitated to this music town in mid-1970, looking to establish their brand of traditional blues among the divergent musical styles that were flourishing in Austin at the time. Although he was again following in his brother's footsteps, when Stevie Vaughan arrived in the city in late 71 with Blackbird, he entered a totally different circuit, playing the popular rock clubs, and within weeks he and the band were propelled to the very top of this scene. 
there was a tendency for people to follow the local acts, and they and people were always interested. And um, and who's the best? Who's got the best guitar player? Who's got the best music? And who's got the best? Where's the best scene happening? You know. And uh, our competition was a band called Cracker Jack. These were founded by two former members of Johnny Winter's band, basically his whole band, Tommy Shannon and Uncle John Turner. And they were a great band. They had a great concept. They had more original stuff than we did. So it was really between Blackbird and Cracker Jack dominated the scene. You know, people would go from one, one bar to the other and, uh, or one gig to the other, you know, um, just to follow us. Jimmy had already moved here, and so I'd gotten to know Jimmy, and I'd been playing with Jimmy and stuff, and so I, Jimmy and I had become friends, and so Stevie would come down here, and so that, and so I started getting to know Stevie a little bit, and I think I probably first heard him here playing with that band Blackbird, and, and he was maybe 17, maybe not much more than that, and and he, ob he oh, God, now there's two of them, you know, it, it was, it was obvious pretty early on to a lot of people that, well, we're going to be hearing more from this kid, too. And unlike in Dallas, audiences in Austin at the time were more aware of Stevie Vaughan's talents than those of his older brother. While Blackbird played at the South Door, the Waterloo Social Club and other venues on the rock circuit to packed crowds, Jimmy's band Storm were playing a residency at the One Night Club, struggling to draw attention to a musical form that was no longer in demand. There was a pure blue scene in Austin, no question, and, and Jimmy was right at the center of it. But it was a very separate scene from our circuit. Um, some people crossed over to go hear Jimmy and Storm at the one night, but a lot of people didn't. They really followed either Cracker Jack or, or Blackbird. It wasn't really happening. People didn't, it was like, you gave a gig and nobody came, you know, I mean, Sometimes we'd make three or four dollars a piece there. So, you know, I mean, it was like I was really surprised because I thought that, I mean, I don't know how good we were. We couldn't have been that bad because Doyle was singing and playing drums and Jimmy was playing guitar and I was playing guitar. And I thought, well, gosh, it couldn't be that bad, you know. And plus, but, but whether we were good or not, Jimmy was in the band. And, and I just thought, well, he's got cachet already. But it appeared that the further Jimmy got into blues, it was kind of inversely proportional to the people that had an interest in him or something. But we were stubborn and determined, and we had some fairly significant members among our number, and so we wouldn't go, we didn't go away. But it was not, it was not easy. While the blues players remained on the margins, in the second half of 1972, the short reign of Blackbird on the rock circuit came to an end. Despite the popularity of the group, internal differences and a lack of progression caused band members to depart, and by the end of the year, similar problems had beset their rivals, Cracker Jack. This led to the initial brief union of bassist Tommy Shannon and Stevie Ray Vaughan. At a certain point, David Framer, bass player, he decided he wanted to leave the band and he, was, he went with this band Too Smooth. I think they had a record deal too. So David left and that kind of left us with no bass player and Cracker Jack was starting to dissolve. So we got Tommy to come over into, into our band. Not too long after that, Christian left the band and then Bruce Bolin was the singer. So it was Stevie, Shannon, Bolin and myself and we play, played that way maybe six months. <laughs> By December 72, the constant lineup changing saw Stevie Vaughan drafted into a reformed Cracker Jack, yet this lasted only two months before disbanding. Despite these disappointments, a new project was about to pull the young guitarist out of Austin and back into a recording studio. Mark Benno, whose career had gained significant momentum since Stevie joined him on stage back in 69, was looking for fresh inspiration. Having moved to the West Coast at the tail end of the 60s, successfully establishing himself first in the group The Asylum Choir with Leon Russell, and later as a solo artist, Benno returned to his home state in March 1973, looking to assemble a Texas blues band for his new record. The first player he approached was Jimmy Vaughan. He said, no, I don't want to play any rock. I'm done with rock. I'm just going to play pure blues and that's it. You know, I went, well, okay. I said, you know, I don't have to... I don't know if I'm just going to play Jimmy Reed, but I mean, I'm not going to play that far. No, no, that stuff you play is rock and roll compared to what I'm going to do. And I thought, well, that's kind of an insult, but he's probably right. And he said, but what about my brother? 
So Jimmy had me follow him over to Mother Blues, a club in Austin, to see his brother playing. And when I walked in, they were already playing. He was great. And I thought, oh, that probably could work. And then what happened was Jimmy had told Stevie, you better do it. This guy's got a contract. If it was me, I'd do it. Go to Hollywood. Go. And, and he did. With Stevie on board, Benno also enlisted ex-chessmen Doyle Bramhall and Billy Etheridge into his new ensemble, the Nightcrawlers. At the close of March 1973, the band flew to Los Angeles and headed to Sunset Sound Studios in Hollywood to begin work on the album. Brushing shoulders with an array of musical legends and introduced to the narcotic excesses of the LA music scene, Stevie Vaughan was thrust into a totally new environment. Yet despite his lack of studio experience, the youngest member of the ensemble provided both consistency and creativity. He never ran out of ideas or made mistakes. There was no two takes for him. We'd go in the studio and we'd be trying something. He'd just play along with it, it'd be beautiful. You want to do it again? Okay, he'd play something else beautiful. But we never, ever did a second take because Stevie was nervous or something and made a mistake. He was neither. He would loosen us up. He kept us loose, and then he could play such serious parts that you'd hear them, and they just, what is, you know, burn your sideburns off. I think in the recordings with Mark Benno, we, we hear that Stevie has refined his style. Uh, he's not as haphazard. He, he knows where he's going, and he can get back to where he came from more easily in his solos. And um, just a, a more professional uh, approach. The sessions for the album not only showcased Vaughan's growing stylistic and technical abilities, but also developed previously untapped skills. Although the project was ostensibly a solo album for singer and songwriter Mark Benno, he encouraged his band, in particular Stevie and Doyle Bramhall, to collaborate in the composition of certain tracks. If I brought anything to the table, when I was a young guy, I was a songwriter. These guys began to see it in me and take the suggestions and ideas from me, which I had gotten from Leon, who's a brilliant songwriter, J.J. Kale, who began to write these original tunes rather than just do Jimmy Reed or somebody else's tunes. So these guys picked up quick, and like and as they were great drummers, great guitar players, great, they became great songwriters immediately. They pick that stuff up. And I go, whoops, uh, you're not going to need me much longer. <laughs> This was really Stevie's first foray into songwriting with a big help from Doyle. They were good at it. They were a good songwriting team. Dirty Pool ended up being recorded by Stevie on one of his albums. It stayed one of the staples of his stage show really for the rest of his life. So he came out of the shoot with Doyle uh, really fast. Uh, and then the band with Mark Benno also recorded a song called Crawlin', and that originated out of an instrumental that Stevie created, and the band itself put together some lyrics and the rest of the music. And so Stevie, uh, here at age 19, has started songwriting, uh, but he didn't really continue it that we know of with, with little exception until he started his own band about five years later. And I was being played by a fool. Love, true love is gone. And I was being played by a fool. I'm turning. 
Cause you've been playing dirty blue You said you called the shot When he would do an interlude or just anything on the record, it would just jump off the record. You know, I always had an expression that the more of a person that you are, I don't know if this is true or not, but the more of a person that you are and the more substance you have in your being, then when you make that record, it's like a thumbprint. And the bigger the print, the bigger the soul of the person. He had such a big print that when he would play, whoa, he would just jump off the record to everything. He'd go, well, there he is. So, and the same with Doyle. Doyle's voice would just be huge. Now, you have some people with a great voice going to record a record. The presence is not there. The, the soul is not there. The person, something's not there. And I call it the print. And both of these guys had gigantic prints. Despite the obvious talents of the players he'd selected for these sessions, when Benno delivered the results to A&M Records, they were disappointed by the recordings and lost interest in the project. During the summer of 1973, the band briefly hit the road as Mark Benno and the Nightcrawlers and played a series of shows supporting Humble Pie. Yet their drink and drug consumption was now out of control and they were dropped from the tour. Benno made his way back to Los Angeles in an attempt to rebuild his career, while Vaughan and the other band members returned to Austin. They stayed together, however, and continued to play as the Nightcrawlers, with Doyle Bramhall taking over as the frontman. Yet unlike Blackbird, they had little interest in the rock circuit, and the band settled into a residency at the One Nightclub. Stevie Vaughan was now a part of Austin's marginal blues scene. At one point, Mark Benno left and they became just the Nightcrawlers, a quartet with Doyle and Stevie, Bruce Miller, Billy Etheridge on keyboards. And they played around Austin and they played around Texas, uh, played in Dallas, all over the place. I roadied for uh, the Nightcrawlers. As far as Stevie's technical abilities, he was always great. He always had great technical ability. He just got more and more intense and more refined. In the Nightcrawlers was the first time I heard Stevie start to sound more like a blues player than a rock player. He had gotten hold of a, uh, I believe it was a Howard Roberts uh, uh, hollow body electric guitar, which is, it has a very fat body, and he was learning to play West Montgomery octave runs, and he was getting that. There's a song called Chitlin's Con Carney. I don't remember who did it, but Stevie learned it, and he sounded like a man with a Howard Roberts guitar, not a man with a rock guitar. That's the first time I heard Stevie as a blues player. Although Vaughan remained on and off with the Nightcrawlers for over a year, in Austin, the blues scene still had a very limited appeal, and the band struggled to gain popularity. Yet in December 1974, they supported an Austin ensemble who was successfully bringing blues and roots music into larger venues. Paul Ray and the Cobras. Featuring two ex-members of Jimmy Vaughan's earlier group, Storm, this band represented a possible next step for Stevie. In the 70s, Paul Ray and the Cobras were top of the heap in Austin. They were the hottest band in town. The music they played was rhythm and blues, it was e and blues, and it was easy to dance to. That brought the girls in, and the girls brought the guys in. But it was the music that held it all together and the Cobras were the best. It was a New Year's Eve in Dallas. We were playing a place called Taco Flats. We had a deal where the Nightcrawlers were opening. And during the break between bands, Stevie came up and said, can I play with you guys? And I went, sure, of course. We could use another instrument. And so he got up on the stage and started playing, and everything just picked up. And uh, it was just, he fit. He was so deferential, everybody, and so genuine and all. He didn't, he didn't have any sort of an attitude. He just, he wanted to just keep playing. He's ready to play some more. Kid was phenomenal. To be honest, I was going, well, gosh, you know, I've been carrying it for a year, and it kind of would be nice to have maybe a piano player, really. But I, I really like Stevie. And he was, he was real good, so, I mean, he was younger than me, but he was, so he was a really good player. And, and besides that, everybody else wanted Stevie in the band. Why, not, why wouldn't you? 
And he always was really nice to me. He treated me with respect and I treated him with respect. We supported each other and so it, it actually worked out, worked out good. Stevie's inclusion in the Cobras propelled the band to even greater popularity. By March 1975, they began a residency at the Soap Creek Saloon, and here they would develop a reputation as one of the most exciting acts on the Austin circuit, with Vaughan and Denny Freeman's incendiary and complimentary guitar work a highlight for audiences. And while they were expanding their fan base, a new venue appeared in the city that single-handedly pulled blues music back into the spotlight. Antone's nightclub, dubbed Austin's Home of the Blues, opened on July 15, 1975, its owner, Clifford Antone, looking to establish a setting where the greatest names on the national scene could play alongside less established local talent. Almost overnight, it changed everything. The importance and the significance of Antone's nightclub, it couldn't be exaggerated. I mean, it was a great place for blues and for Austin because if you're into what we were into, it was the cream of the crop that was playing here, you know, at Antone's, Little Austin. Clifford Antone tried to make it really easy by having people stay there maybe as long as a week, make it worth their while to drive down if they had, you know, a lot, a lot of people don't like to fly or couldn't afford or whatever. And so it was, it was hugely important. And then for all the rest of us, it was like Blues College to get to know uh, all of your heroes. I mean, before that, I, I had to go to Chicago because I wanted to hear Howlin' Wolf and Magic Sam and Otis Rush and Muddy, and I, I got to meet some of those people and, and everything, but it, it's rather inconvenient to go all the way to Chicago to hear Chicago blues. It was a huge support for all of us who really did take blues seriously and realized, because we'd done enough playing around, that, um, that it wasn't in demand, it had gone off of the radio. There were no longer blues shows on the radio. None of that kind of support. And people just didn't think it was hip or cool or anything else. You've got a club owner that's willing to basically underwrite all this. And that's a big difference. You're not playing little shitholes anymore. The one night's no longer good enough. Antone's University is what built the blues scene here and what made possible the success of Stevie Ray Vaughan, as well as many other blues players out of here. With the club booking Muddy Waters, John Lee Hooker, Lightning Hopkins, and a who's who of the greatest living blues players available, it soon became a venue of international renown. As the white Austin musicians began to sit in with these legends, it enabled them to develop their own techniques, and in some cases, to build friendships they previously had only dreamed of. Back in the early days of Anton's, we had Albert King. Albert was one of those really serious guys. Didn't take any fooling around. He never uh, felt gratitude that white people had finally come to the party and started attending blues shows and so forth. It was one afternoon and I know uh, Clifford, <laughs> Clifford just realized how much it would mean to Stevie, being a huge Albert fan, if maybe, maybe he would let him up on stage with him. That night, Albert's up on stage wailing, of course, and he gets little Stevie up there with him. Well, in a very short while, he realized that Stevie was, half of Stevie's playing was, a, you know, in adulation of his own style. And I've never seen such a big smile on Albert King's face. Well, of course, everybody was thrilled, and especially thrilled for Stevie, and they went on to be <laughs> great friends. That was a wonderful moment at Anton's. With the Austin blues scene given a much needed injection of energy through this venue, over the next year and a half, Paul Ray and the Cobras remained one of the most exciting local acts on the circuit eclipsed only by Jimmy Vaughan's new outfit, The Thunderbirds, who had become the house band at Antone soon after their formation. Yet in an attempt to spread their appeal outside of Austin, it was the Cobras who first entered the studio in late 1976 to produce a seven-inch single. With Paul Ray and the Cobras, Stevie got another opportunity to go into the recording studio. And the band recorded two songs, Texas Clover 
and the other was other days. The recording was made essentially as a business card for the band. They needed to be able to give a demo or something to promoters and club owners to show the band, to show them what the band could do. And so that was the primary purpose of having this record. The days I see the sun begin to shine. The ways you rest the clouds before my mind. What can I say? Your thoughts and words should be so kind. Back then, it was like a calling card, you know, back then. You gave me a record. Here, this is my record. On the other day's side, Stevie just takes off. I mean, he just, there was a space for him, and he just jumped in it and took off playing that solo. Stevie played a nice solo on other days. I'm just not sure that it was that exciting a performance overall. The song on the other side was, it was an interesting song. Paul Ray had written a song called Texas Clover and it was a nice song. I don't really, it was almost kind of country the way he originally wrote it and we were tr just messing around with it trying to figure out, Paul wrote it on, a, on an acoustic guitar and we were trying to figure out what to do with it. And I remember saying, Stevie saying, let's try it with a reggae beat. And, and I remember going, let's do, good idea. The Cobra single was significant because it was a single, it was a local product, and, and it wasn't like the 60s when every band was cutting 45s. This was a different kind of environment. There was no music business in Austin. There was like a couple of recording studios that were okay. People weren't making a whole lot of records out of here. This was a live scene, a live town. Well, they made a single, and to me it was okay. It got a little bit of a local airplay. Uh, I, the general impression was, yeah, it's good they got a record out, but that ain't the band. I mean, you want to go hear the Cobras, go hear the Cobras live. As the Cobras live were going from strength to strength, their victory in the Austin Sun Readers Poll in March 1977, in which they were named Band of the Year, secured them better pay and bigger audiences. And for Stevie Vaughan, their performances were not only showcasing his virtuosity as a guitarist, but over time were also allowing him space to develop as a vocalist. I think he learned a lot in the Cobras. I think it was kind of like graduate school for him because uh, I don't think he'd ever sung with the band. I don't think he'd ever uh, fronted the band. And the way we said it, the way I had it set up, me and Danny, we wanted it to be like a review. And so it'd be Denny instrumental, Stevie instrumental, Rodney wanted to sing. Uh, then they'd bring me up and I'd do the rest of the set. And uh, that's where Stevie learned to front a band and uh, you know do all that. I said, all you kids from Texas go so big and tall. All you kids from Texas go so big and tall. All of you like to roll in that cheap hall. Well, get high, everybody get high. To me, it was just kind of obvious that he had tried to learn from Doyle. I mean, he played with Doyle a lot when Doyle was singing, and, and Doyle was, a, uh, we thought, a great singer. And, and, and I, I mean, Stevie could carry a tune, and he had a, it was a, a manly voice. I mean, it was, I mean, I was, I would, I'd, I'd be real happy if I could sing that well. So I, it was, I thought it was good, you know, it was good. Pl plenty good enough. Like 
Stevie sang with authority. That, that's what he. I, I always thought that he sang with authority, from the from the word go. You know. By mid 1977, Vaughan had grown sufficiently confident fronting the Cobras that he decided it was time to move on. After years of weaving in and out of other people's bands, he was now ready to form his own. He always was looking ahead and trying to figure out what to do. He realized, you know. I should sing, and I should put the pressure on myself to just do that and have a tight band. And I really admired that, and that's actually, he came to me and said, how do I start singing? You know, how do I do this? You know, I think he knew he could. He just sort of needed some suggestions. So, well, I told him, pick a favorite song, just start with one song and do it. Of course, he picked Texas Flood, which I'd been singing for a few years and haven't been able to sing since, since it became his song. I thought that was the most practical suggestion. Pick something you like and just go for it. He came up to me at a rehearsal uh, and said, well, I'm thinking of getting my own band. And I said, I think you should. I mean, you're a star, you're, you know how to lead a band. and you know, and, and you've got all that stuff you want to play, and I think, it's a, you know, I think it's a great idea. I think all of us knew that at some point he was going to have to do that. You know, we, nobody really knew when, but I think all of us, I think everybody just was just kind of waiting for him to be ready to go out and be Stevie Ray Vaughan. So we just said, go do it. In forming the band, which he would call the Triple Threat Review, rather than assemble whichever Austin players were available at the time, Vaughan decided to hand-pick his ensemble. He approached pianist Mike Kindred, drummer Freddie Walden, singer Luann Barton and Austin blues legend W.C. Clarke and successfully convinced them all to join him. That was a pretty big leap for him, and it was very ballsy for him to go approach W.C. Clarke at McMorris Ford, where W.C. had his day job, but here was a guy that was a soul singer, blues singer, a black man from East Austin that had had success. He'd seen the world. And here's this scrawny little kid saying, I want to start a band and I want you in it. Balls, big balls. It's possible to characterize Triple Threat Review as a sort of Texas supergroup. He'd heard about Luann Barton, she was a great blues singer out of Fort Worth, and he knew W.C. Clark. W.C. had been in a band called Southern Feeling with Angel Estrelli and others. Stevie brought all of these elements together from these other bands and other parts of Texas into one cohesive unit. This unit, Triple Threat, was heavily inspired by the review format of Paul Ray and the Cobras, in which every member of the band had their time in the spotlight. Although he would be handling some of the vocals himself, Stevie looked to both W.C. Clarke and Luann Barton to take the majority of the lead parts. And when the band debuted in August 1977, they immediately made their mark on the Austin circuit, in particular, the sultry Barton. She was just a sassy little sex kitten that could sing. She was, she was just a force, you know, and, and, and you couldn't help but Acknowledge it when you saw her. We're going to do a song now. It's a blues featuring Stevie Vaughan on slide guitar called Will My Man Be Home Tonight? Opening night, I went to see him, and I was just blown away at how they'd obviously not rehearsed to the 
too much and just enough to, you know, you know that song, you know, okay, it's in this key, and but uh, it knocked me out. And, you know, there was three-part harmony and when they needed it, but also everybody got their, their shot out front. And it was, a, it was a great band. Yet over the coming months, despite their prestigious lineup, the band struggled to make too much of an impact on a scene dominated by Jimmy Vaughan's now seasoned fabulous Thunderbirds and the ever popular Cobras. They weren't that successful again. This is like, you know, on a good night, can pull in maybe a, 150, 200 people to some place like Austex or After Hours or maybe the Continental Club. And let me put it in this context. On Monday night, the Thunderbirds had the hottest little weekly residency at this club by the university called the Rome Inn. That was the biggest thing going. Sunday nights belonged to Stevie Ray Vaughan and Triple Threat Review. You'd be lucky to get 50 people in there. Not only were the band unable to break into the top tier of the blues circuit, but the five strong personalities within the ensemble were also pulling in different directions. In early May 1978, Triple Threat Review split up. Stevie immediately set about forming a new unit, Double Trouble, with he and Luann Barton now the sole lead vocalists. By September, they had settled into a lineup that included bassist Jack Newhouse, saxophonist Johnny Reno, and young drummer Chris Layton. And it was as the leader of this unit that Vaughan began to truly develop. Yet he still lacked the confidence to front the band on his own. Stevie and the band would come out and do an hour, 30 minutes or an hour, then Lou Ann would come out and do the last few songs of the first set. Then they would feature Lou Ann pretty much through a second set. Then for a third set, Lou Ann would come out, do a few more songs, then she would sit down for the evening and the rest of it would be Stevie's. So it's all incremental steps to making Stevie the front man. He was edging closer and closer to being a trio. Uh, and essentially the early days of Double Trouble with Lou Ann it was a trio, plus Lou Anne. Yet for audiences, Vaughan was now becoming the main attraction. Returning to songwriting for the first time since the Los Angeles sessions with Mark Benno and Doyle Bramhall, he added new originals to the sets and became the creative driving force of the group. In April 1979, a young booking agent, Joe Priesnitz, was invited to attend a Double Trouble concert to see whether he'd consider signing them to his newly established agency, Rock Arts Management. We were trying to build our roster, and uh, my partner came in one day and said, hey, we're gonna go see Stevie Vaughan tonight. I remember it like it was yesterday. We walked into the Armadillo, and Stevie, they were just, they had just gone on stage, and just started playing, and uh, it was just one of those moments where I just went, yeah, that's it. He has it. Not that there was anything wrong with Lou Ann, she was certainly a great part of the band and you know the rhythm section was good. It was uh, Chris Layton and Jackie Newhouse at that time. But um, it was, it just swept over me that yeah, this, he, he's got it. Priesnitz instantly signed Double Trouble and Rock Arts aimed to spread their appeal beyond Austin. To aid the promotion of the band, in June 1979, with the backing of local DJ Joe Gracie, Stevie and Double Trouble traveled to Nashville to work on sessions with legendary Sun Studios engineer Jack Clement. The resultant recordings disappointed the band and went unreleased, yet they remain the only document of this short-lived lineup. Well, these early recordings are very interesting because at this stage, they're kind of a bar band. It's, it's roadhouse blues. It's, it's, it's the sort of music that, in your dreams, you, you would like to imagine you know, every little bar or roadhouse you go into in Texas, there'd be a band in the corner playing this kind of, 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 of music. Um, and it's quite instructive because some of the tracks from those early recordings, uh, or some of the songs from those early recordings, uh, turn up in, in more developed versions on uh, Texas Flood. So you can, you can make that comparison. And uh, they're a lot rawer and earthier. Um, but I think, you, you know, you can still hear in, in Stevie Ray Vaughan that this guy has, has got something special. Well, sitting on the lonely, feeling all so blue My baby sent me treatment, I don't know what to do A song cry What I have to feel is real I can't live, my baby I can't live another 
melody. We really start to see the double trouble that is eventually going to take the world by storm. Stevie and the band recorded Pride and Joy, Love Struck Baby, Empty Arms, I'm Crying. These are some songs that were staples for Stevie for the rest of his career. He already had Chris Layton in the band, and with the exception of the fact that Tommy wasn't in the band yet on bass, this is double trouble. Uh, Lou Ann was still there. She did about half the songs, but on the other half, it's all Stevie and Double Trouble. Luann Barton is a fairly limited vocalist, I think. You can hear this phenomenal guitar player, and then you can hear this, without wishing to be rude, average female singer. I think at this stage, Stevie Ray Vaughan sees himself as a great guitarist. You know, there's no false modesty here. He knows he's got the chops, as they say. And like a lot of guitarists, he's probably far less confident about his vocal abilities. And so he probably figures that, uh, you know, at this stage, the band needs uh, a specialist vocalist, if we, can, if we can put it like that. When all the time, as he would shortly prove, you know, he was more than capable of doing the job himself. By the fall of 1979, rock art's strategy to expand Double Trouble's reach outside of their Texas comfort zone had proved successful. And in November, they embarked on a tour of the East Coast. Yet by the end of these dates, with little warning, Lou Ann Barton quit the band. With shows already booked throughout Texas in December, a decision had to be quickly made about how the band would cope with the loss of its main vocalist. We got the call, and I think it came from Stevie, that Lou Ann left the band. So the band came back. We had a meeting because we just wanted to figure, so should we get another singer? Um, you know, what's, what's the plan here? Should we cancel the dates, which, you know, nobody wanted to do. We were talking about different ideas, and finally I just said, so who's going to sing? And Stevie looked at me and with this dead glare and said, I am. And he didn't finish the sentence, but I know what he was thinking. <laughs> and he was going to call me <laughs> an expletive, but he didn't. He, you know, he held off. He just said, I am. And uh, I said, OK, well, you know, We'll see you at Steamboat. I think it was within three nights of that. Now a trio, the loss of Luann in fact strengthened the band. Stevie discovering he finally had the confidence and ability to become a full-time frontman. In 1980, they resumed touring across Texas and the East Coast, on occasion performing alongside Jimmy Vaughan's fabulous Thunderbirds, who by now had secured a record deal. And as the world moved into a new decade, there was also growing support for Vaughan and his band from a number of interested parties looking to advance his career. Stevie had met accountant E.D. Johnson back in 1978, and this led to a chain of events that would, by 1980, see his day-to-day -day management taken over by a pivotal figure, Chesley Milliken. E.D. Johnson saw Stevie perform in Austin in the fall of 1978. Stevie was just in a band. They didn't have a team behind him to help promote or publicize the band or, or an agent. They had nothing as a support. So Edie approached her employer, Francis Carr, at Maynard Downs in Austin and said, look, this guy deserves to have uh, some, a team behind him to back him and, and to help make the band uh, successful uh, enough that they can survive. Francis was a woman of considerable wealth coming from a really storied Texas ranching family, the O'Connors, which is one of the first ranching families in Texas, going back to the 1840s. And she had been road manager for the Grateful Dead. She ran with a, a lot of folks, and that's where she met Chesley Milliken, who had been a player in the Ash Grove Folk Club in LA, but was a British gentleman who was the head of Epic UK at one time. Chesley was critical to the band's success. 
from that point and to, and to expand them into larger markets. Uh, and partly because uh, Chesley hired uh, Charles Comer as a publicist. So Stevie now really had a full team behind the band with financial backing, accounting, publicity, and day-to-day and -day management. Milliken initially attempted to expand the group, yet after numerous unsuccessful auditions with assorted instrumentalists and female vocalists, he then looked to strengthen the appeal of the existing trio. The band leader himself took on his full name, Stevie Ray Vaughan, and his rhythm section would now be identified through the group name and Double Trouble. They would no longer be billed or even promote themselves as a blues act, thus distancing them from a specialist marketplace. Yet over the coming months, despite several record companies expressing interest in the band, a contract failed to materialize. I became kind of the de facto rep for the band. I mean, because people would fly in to see them, certain record company people, and you know, they would ask me, they're like, hey, so and so's flying in from MCA and you know, can you kind of, you know, show up and meet him at the venue and do the do the whole thing, which I would and you know, I can't tell you how many times, I mean, dozens of these people would would watch him play and then at the end of the night just say, Well, it, it, there's a great they're a great blues band. Founded. What do you mean? It's just, it's just a great blues band. I mean, can't you see this guy? I mean, this is one of the, he's one of the <laughs> most phenomenal players that's ever, you know, gotten on stage. To me, it was like it was down the road. Certainly going to happen at some point. Somebody was going to recognize his talent at some time. And it didn't matter what kind of music you liked. If you saw this guy play, it was my belief that you would like him. Yet no major label offers were forthcoming and even prominent figures within the record companies themselves struggled to secure any interest in Vaughan and his band. A lot of people were telling me about Stevie Ray. So I was aware of his playing and I saw him play a couple times and uh, saw the excitement that people had around him. So I got some tapes from a friend of mine and I actually sent those to New York and I sent them to the head of uh, A&R that time in New York. I received a letter back with the tapes saying, uh, we're not really interested in signing a blues artist like this, or we would sign a B.B. King or something like that, which I uh, should have kept the letter and the tapes, but I didn't. So I saw there was no interest in him. So unfortunately, I dropped the cause and didn't do anything. With record companies failing to commit, in January 1981, the band made a final crucial change to its lineup. Bassist Jackie Newhouse was replaced by the player who had previously made his name with Johnny Winter back in the late 60s, Stevie's brief Blackbird bandmate, Tommy Shannon. The band had been coming together, Double Trouble, for a while. He's finally waking up to this trio concept. And one of his heroes, Jimi Hendrix, that's how he was performed at his best and could really play. And I think that made sense and also this predecessor, the one guy that really made a noise doing Texas blues and doing it to a rock audience was Johnny Winter. I don't look at it that Stevie was going hunting for a name, but he knew Tommy's work and he knew the context he worked in, which in the power trio thing was perfect. I recall when it went down, it was, I thought it was kind of sudden, but then I saw Tommy play one of his first nights with Stevie and and it was like, okay, I got it. This is, this, is the con this is the combo, this is the combination. Yet even with a tight band and an experienced team behind him, still Stevie struggled to secure a record deal. After a year of heavy touring, in 1982, Chesley Milliken passed a videotape of the trio to Mick Jagger, 
and then arranged a private performance for the Rolling Stones at New York's Danceteria. Amidst rumours in the national music press that Jagger was going to sign Vaughan to his label, after the show he was impressed yet unconvinced of the commercial prospects of the band, and nothing materialised. Yet a more ironic and coincidental turn of events would work in Stevie's favour. Back in Austin, producer and Warner Brothers executive Jerry Wexler had arrived in town to support the release of Luan Barton's debut album, and at the launch party witnessed a Vaughan and Double Trouble performance. Blown away by the show, Wexler called Claude Nobbs, the founder and organiser of the Montreux Jazz Festival in Switzerland, urging him to book the band for his summer event. Nobbs duly obliged, and the subsequent performance would single-handedly alter the course of the band's career. Yet Vaughan's flamboyant Texas blues was far from universally appreciated when they stepped onto the stage on July the 17th, 1982. We didn't have a record, it wasn't like we had product to go over there, and so we first, first unsigned act to play the festival. So we were just going over there to do a gig. We were booked on a night in Montreux where it was predominantly acoustic music, where there was somebody sitting with a guitar, acoustic guitar, upright bass, no drums, or maybe there was, but it was kind of a brushes kind of situation, that kind of thing. It was a very, a very quiet night. So let's welcome with Chris Layton on drums. Chris Layton, Tommy Shannon on bass, Tommy Shannon, Stevie Ray Vaughan, Stevie Ray Vaughan. When Stevie Ray Vaughan appeared at Montreux in 1982, it had a shocking effect upon the audience. People were expecting acoustic blues, and they got this heavy-duty electric blues sound. And in the recordings of this that have been since released, I mean, you hear the boos and the catcalls and people just wanting them to get off stage. But then on the other hand, it also had great appeal. I wasn't at Montreux, I'm not in the audience, but I got the sense it was a fairly purist crowd, kind of like at Antone's, the crowd that believed that the Thunderbirds were really it because they did it just like the old guys did it. And here comes this brash band that's a little louder and playing kind of rocked up. And even if it is Freddie King and he's quoting a guy from his hometown in Dallas and he's playing it flawlessly, it just, maybe it's too loud. So at the end, you hear, it's a mixed reaction. It's like the crowd, there's some cheers, there's some boos, and the boos are audible because it's not, everybody's not going nuts. Thank you so much. But Montro signifies the arrival of Stevie Ray Vaughan in Double Trouble and the revival of American blues music. Been, there was a lot preceding it, there was a lot going on, but this just busted it through and it made it accessible in a way that hadn't been made accessible in the United States, I think, since Led Zeppelin and the Yardbirds and, and, and the British Invasion bands were doing blues. All of the telephone lines are down Yeah, it's flooding down in Texas All of the telephone lines are down there had been this lapse, and when it was least expected, 
and certainly not expected from this kid. He did it, and, and by wisely infusing all the things that he learned. So he rocks it up, and yes, there's a lot of Hendrix in it, and it's the first guy since Hendrix that sounds like Hendrix without imitating Hendrix. Stevie was, was riffing off of Hendrix and the blues he grew up with, the jump blues. And look at it this way, he was carrying on just as Johnny, what a Johnny Winter had done and what ZZ Top had done. He was carrying on that power trio tradition. It was like straight out of cream. You had to take them on that kind of a basis. They, they needed to be regarded. Are, are they better than cream? And that, that's, those are fighting words, man. You know, can this, is this guy as good as Clapton? Well, maybe, maybe even better. So Montro was the throwdown. Here we are. And it became very clear with the recordings that followed it that Stevie brought respect back to blues. He, he brought recognition back to blues. But by making it a completely unique, original, and modern sound again. In the audience for the show were David Bowie and John Paul Hammond, the son of legendary producer John Hammond, and both were astonished by Vaughan and Double Trouble's performance. The following night, the band played an impromptu gig in the more private setting of the Artists' Bar at the festival, and here they were joined on stage by singer-songwriter Jackson Brown, who was equally impressed by the Texan ensemble. The atmosphere of that club was really, you know, it was, it was like a blues club. It was smoky after hours, small, you know. I was playing Montreux, you know, and I, I didn't, I didn't know anything. About it. Actually, I'd heard about Stevie from his manager, from Chesley Milliken, who's a really old friend of mine. But I didn't see the show, and I really only heard about it. Actually, I was being interviewed. Guys from my band came up to where I was sitting in this restaurant, really excited, said, you have to come down here. Just, just whatever, excuse us, but whatever you do, you gotta stop and come see this. The opportunities that these fresh connections subsequently presented to Stevie and his band were invaluable. While Bowie proposed that Vaughan play a role on his forthcoming album, and Hammond enthusiastically passed recordings on to his influential father, Brown offered recording time to the band at his LA studio. In November 1982, still yet to secure a record deal, Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble headed to the West Coast, and sessions began on the material that would eventually become their debut album, Texas Flood. We thought, well, why don't we take Jackson up on that offer? and let's go to Los Angeles, which we couldn't really even afford to just go there and go do that, even if that part of it was for free. So we booked a small tour. And he showed up and there was a you know, voice on the end of the phone saying, well, we're here. I <laughs> said, he, hello, who is it? Yeah, you know, he said it was them and they were here and that, you know, they were ready to record. And I went, well, you know, it's, okay, wait a second, you know, like, and who's, who wants to record this guy? Because it was th it was about to be Thanksgiving holiday, and we were everybody was planning on leaving and stopping recording. So in that respect, it was really great time. So the guy that stepped into the, the spot was James Geddes, who was a second engineer and uh, very capable engineer, and and who I later recorded a couple records with. We went in, set up, and did you know played through our show a couple of times. Each day is really what it amounted to. It wasn't a recording studio with other people and other musicians coming in and out. It was just this sort of, uh, you know, funky downtown location, and and uh, they had they had a week to do whatever they do when they were at home or when you know. 1983 was the year in which Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble's fortunes changed. Not only did the band have professional recordings completed for the first time. They also had a team behind them trying to build on the momentum created by the Montreux shows. In January, Stevie traveled to New York to begin a week of sessions for David Bowie's latest album, Let's Dance. The following month, 
In an attempt to expand the band's presence on the live circuit, Chesley Millikin decided to drop Joe Priesnitz's Austin-based rock arts and approached Alex Hodges, a booking agent who had been pivotal in breaking the Allman Brothers Band and other Southern rock acts across America. I got to call Alex, you got to come see this guy, you got to come see Stevie Ray Vaughan. And it so happened I'd heard his name before, but I'd never seen him and hadn't heard any product. So, and it turns out there was no album out. It was, he had not been picked up by a label and, you know, t time was moving on. But Chesley really believed in him and said, come see Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble. I agreed. I sent a guy, though, instead of going to Texas myself. And uh, my friend and an employee, a young, youngster, came back and said, we just got to sign this guy. This is, this is your cup of tea, Alex, you know. And I said, okay, so what's the criteria? And Chesley had given a mandate, because Stevie was working clubs. So Chesley Milliken had given a mandate of no gig under $1,000. Hodges immediately booked Vaughan and Double Trouble to support Greg Allman at a show in Atlanta. And shortly thereafter, the guitarist who had been plying his trade in Austin for over a decade would finally transcend the Texas club circuit. On March 15, 1983, through John Hammond's influence, the band signed a record deal with Epic Records, a subsidiary of CBS. Two days later, the title track from David Bowie's forthcoming album was released. Let's Dance became the fastest selling single in the artist's 20 year recording career and his first US number one. The album, issued in the April, was equally successful and provided a perfect platform to introduce Stevie Ray Vaughan to a global audience. The Bowie connection was a mantle of significance to this new, at that time, unknown guitar player. Mick Ronson, Earl Swift, Carlos Alomar, later uh, Reeves Gabrels, okay. We better pay attention, this guy knows talent. Uh, with saxophone, Bowie had discovered uh, David Sanborn. Um, some of my, you know, see, these are some of my favorite players that, that David Bowie had introduced. He seemed to have a very keen ear and eye for taking unknown talent but integrating it into his music brilliantly. It's a disco song and it's a number one dance single, but there's a break in there where you hear Texas blues. There's a genuineness that I don't pick up in Mick Ronson. Mick Ronson, great technician. Throw down a lot of different styles and he plays them all very well. But this is the Texas difference. And this is where when you get to blues, it's the old line, you can't live in Texas if you don't have a lot of soul. I can't, I can't qualify that soul. It's just either you got it or you don't. You listen to Less Dance and that little guitar track in the middle on the break. That's soul. Not only had Vaughan made an impact with his appearance on the record, by late April he was also beginning rehearsals with Bowie's band for the singer's Serious Moonlight World Tour. With an offer for the guitarist and Double Trouble to also open certain shows, this appeared the perfect vehicle to expose them to a global audience. Yet there were conflicts, with Epic also wishing to release the recordings made at Jackson Brown's studio the previous November as a debut album. Jack Chase, who was overseeing the marketing of this proposed LP across the Southwest for Epic, was among a number of skeptics who believed that the Bowie tour might in fact prove detrimental to Vaughan's career. If we didn't break them, uh, the rest of the country at that point was going to say, if you can't get him broken out of Texas, then why should we play them in New York or Seattle or whatever? So Chesa came over and we talked about it and so on. and. Uh, uh, he asked me what I thought and what I could do, and I told him, well, on a new artist like this, it uh, really takes us working together with the group and so on, and that 
my feeling was him playing with David uh, was going to get him seen by a lot of people. But what was it going to do with his career uh, as far as working this new album? I told him, when you release a new artist in the fall, a new artist, uh, you're not going to get anything done with it because all the superstars come out with their artists and you release a new artist like Stevie Ray Vaughan, he's going to be put way in the back of the store and you're going to lose focus on that artist. He seemed to understand what I was saying and he said, let me call you back and we'll talk to Stevie and he came back in about three hours and said Stevie's off the tour. It was a key moment in the young artist's career. Immediately following the announcement, the music press began to ask questions about this young Texan upstart who had walked out on Bowie. Yet what appeared to be career suicide instead gave Vaughan an unprecedented amount of publicity only a month before the issuing of his debut album. Seizing on this unexpected good fortune, Stevie and the band went to work promoting their forthcoming release. He worked every radio station, every club we wanted him to work, every in-store. And I'll say this about Stevie, and it was always true from then until the end. Stevie was an artist that never said no. He did every in-store you wanted him to do, no matter what his physical condition was. Uh, he would do everything, he'd sign every autograph, he would do everything you wanted him to do, and that made a big deal for us. Uh, Tommy and Chris were the same. They would do everything for us, so that made a big difference. With over a decade as a professional musician behind him, in June 1983, Stevie Ray Vaughan finally saw his work released to the public. Although it divided critics at the time, Texas Flood would become a landmark in popular music, the album that revitalized a genre written off as irrelevant and introduced the world to one of the greatest guitarists of all time. Texas Flood is one of the great debut albums. I think one thing we have to remember is that by the time he comes to record this, Stevie Ray Vaughan is 29 years old. There's a maturity there already. He's comfortable in his skin. He's taken all of his influences and, you know, he, he, he wears them on his sleeve pretty uh, uh, openly. Uh, but, you know, he's, he's learned what to do with them and how to blend them into his own sound. And I sometimes think, listening to Texas Flood, that, you know, nobody should be allowed to make their debut album until they're nearly 30. Because, you know, there's a strength there. It's fully formed. It's, it's fully developed. Well, I'm a love struck, baby, I must confess. Life was that you got in this side of the best. Thinking that you, baby, give me such a thrill. I got a hat. I first heard Stevie Ray Vaughan in April 1983. It was on a cassette, it was a promotional. I was in my 66 Le Mans, Pontiac Le Mans, and I drove from the radio station over to get a hamburger, and I popped this thing in, and you know, Pride and Joy was the second song on side one, and I thought, this is really good. And the thing is, it didn't sound like anything else in America at the time. Let's be honest, okay? It was Men at Work and Duran Duran and the New Romantics, okay? Boy George and Culture Club. I mean, these people were at the top of the charts, all right? Even if you go rock, okay, you've got Rush and ACDC uh, selling gazillions of records. Police, Synchronicity was that year. I can, believe me, I can rattle off to you 
the big albums that came out in 1983. Blockbuster, multi-million sellers, okay? It's like a, a, you know, a tugboat among all these big battleships, okay? And the tugboat was Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble was this Texas Flood album. This was the only flavor like that. And so I was the program director and the music director. I went back to my station in, in, in Memphis, Rock 103, and we added Pride and Joy, what's called out of the box, meaning the first week it's available to play on the radio, we added it. been foolish for songs like Love Struck Baby and Pride and Joy. He synthesized, learned all this stuff, and then spat it back out, and that's his. It's not someone else's song. Texas Flood, the album, announces to the world, hey folks, Texas Blues is back. It's dominant. It's better than ever. And yet, Lenny, this is Stevie Ray Vaughan, the complete musician. like a whole other side and that's that's the first hint this guy isn't just a blues man he isn't just a power trio band leader he is truly a great guitarist an instrumentalist of his own right that's transcending whatever kind of categories you want to stuff him into so that album wow Following the album's release, the band immediately hit the road, playing shows across the US and Canada, as well as the Reading Festival in the UK and a subsequent European tour. Yet to reach larger audiences, Vaughan was still going to have to open shows for more popular artists. With a sound that was so conspicuously absent from the modern marketplace, looking for the right supporting slots on which to fit the band proved difficult. Although they were placed on bills opening for contemporary artists, Alex Hodges also considered booking them to support older classic rock acts, and this led to their first arena tour with the Moody Blues. We debated that. My own staff said, don't do that, it's too old an audience. And I thought that this audience would appreciate Stevie's music, A. B, Stevie would be geared to just blow them away. And also that he would be on a big stage. It was an arena tour when we accepted the opportunity to go out with Moody Blues. We did it and that worked. So we bridged the gap between, you know, a little bit younger audience who was, who was finding him in the clubs and going to listen to his record and taking advantage of some of that style of music uh, uh, that was out there and that had been so successful. Shortly after the closing show of the Moody Blues tour in December 1983, Vaughan headed to Ontario, Canada to be reunited with blues legend Albert King. The performance, filmed for the In Session TV show, saw a guitarist who had suddenly been propelled to international fame return to the music that had taken him there, alongside his greatest inspiration. Texas Flood, Stevie Ray Vaughan demonstrated his mastery of the guitar. When he recorded with Albert King, he showed his ability to lay back. I'm 
the crawl. It's very impressive the extent to which Stevie was able to feed and nurture. He's a young musician. Young musicians often want to blow the music away. And he held back. It was reverential in a way, a great amount of respect. That was the best validation of all because that was the badass who would never give anyone any quarter, acknowledging, you know, this is my guy. This guy does it. He does it like I do it. And he may even do it better, but I respect the hell out of him. And getting respect from Albert King does not, can't buy that. Very few players could play Albert King and do it well and do it authentically and get Albert King to even acknowledge, hey, they can do me pretty good. Stevie was with that one guy, and to me, that's where, uh, that's when you realize this is not a local thing, this is not a fluke, this isn't got nothing to do with management or, or talent scouts or record labels. This is a musician getting respect from the musician he respected most. Having both reinvigorated Texas blues and firmly established himself internationally, over the following years, Vaughan would blaze a distinctive trail through the contemporary music world. Stevie loved to come to Antone's and just walk up there with his buddies and play some blues, but I don't think he liked anything better than that. But when it came time for him to write songs or make records, I don't think he wanted to be limited to just playing blues. Stevie became a rock star. And when I say rock, that means you can be a blues man, but rock star is something much bigger and, and more all-encompassing. So people were hearing him in a different kind of context than matched up with Albert King or Larry Davis. It's a new period of exploration. And you don't know where he's really gonna go with it, but he's definitely out of his comfort zone and taking more risks. Yet these risks included seriously jeopardizing his health. And as his popularity soared, Vaughan's lifestyle of excess would spiral out of control. The end of the final decade of his life was, however, remarkable, not only for his successful rehabilitation, but for the renewed passion he brought to his music. The schedule is so hectic and so um, supported in that way because you just keep going because, you know, there's money to be made, right? The human element and suffering gets taken out. And so, you know, he's getting frail, you know, he's trying to keep up. Um, he knows there's issues he's trying to deal with and this isn't the way to be dealing with them. It was a new beginning. I was like, okay, this is my bottom. I don't have many choices here. It's either I die, I end up in jail, or I get better. He was concerned about would he have the fire in his plan that he had uh, before. And he just didn't know because he had never gone through rehab before. And, um, and it turned out to be a groundless worry. All he had to do was listen to the Instep album. The sound was unbelievable. What happens is over time, you don't realize how sloppy somebody gets when they're in the throes of substance abuse. I mean, it all came together. It all became in focus. This really healthy Stevie Ray Vaughan playing just outside of himself and singing like he'd never sung before. To me, what's important about the life and music and legacy of Stevie Ray Vaughan is that he confronted his demons and he won.